Douglas Roche is a Canadian diplomat, politician, and author. He has a distinguished career in public service, particularly in the field of disarmament and peace building, which is the subject of this simulation. So uh, Roche uh, served as a member of Parliament in Canada from 1972 to 1984, representing the Progressive Conservative Party. During his time in Parliament, he held various positions, including Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance and Chairman of the Standing Committee on External Affairs and National Defense. One of Douglas Roche's notable contributions in his work in disarmament and nuclear nonproliferation is uh, he served as Canada's ambassador for disarmament from 1984 to 1989. And he played a significant role in the negotiation and adoption of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, uh, the NPT. Uh, he has been a strong advocate for nuclear disarmament and has campaigned extensively for peace and global security. He has authored several books on peace, disarmament, and international relations. Uh, some of his notable works include the Human Right to Peace and the United Nations in the 21st Century. He has also been involved with various international organizations and initiatives focused on peace and disarmament. He has received numerous honors and awards for his work, including the Mahatma Gandhi Peace Award uh, and the Order of Canada. Mahatma Gandhi, of course, being a world federalist himself. Uh, he continues to be an active advocate for peace and nuclear disarmament, working to promote dialogue, cooperation, and global security. So, uh, without delay, uh, I will now pass it on to uh, Douglas Roche. Well, thank you, and uh, hello to all. Earlier, at an earlier session this morning, I heard a delegate express uh, a hope that we would be able to find a way to uh, actually get to a better world. And um, I want to, to express that hope at the outset of my remarks this, uh, this afternoon, uh, that humanity it can actually achieve a peaceful and just coexistence. Now, this may seem a fanciful wish, considering that we're living through a time of scarring tragedy. The Ukraine war, in which hundreds of thousands have been killed or wounded, millions displaced, the use of nuclear weapons threatened, famines worsened, and the global political system thrown into turmoil. So how can we get to a place of hope after that? We can get there by realizing that a new agenda for peace and a blueprint for sustainable development are actually in our hands. A new chapter is beginning in the story of humanity's long journey to live in peace. All the factors to build common security are in place. The political framework, the scientific and technological capacity to meet human needs, the communications between peoples everywhere who now understand that survival demands that we work together. This accomplishment is itself a reason for hope. Now, wait a minute, many will say, what about the violent conflicts continuing to take a toll on human life? What about the starvation affecting millions? What about global warming? threatening to make huge areas of the planet uninhabitable? What about the continued modernization of nuclear weapons leading us to the edge of Armageddon? These harried questions pull us back to everyday reality. They are in every newscast. And so, beaten down by the tumult and rancor around us, many have formed a distinctly negative view of the future of the world. They see only the clouds, but not the light waiting to break through. We must shake off the bad news. This doesn't mean denying it. Rather, it means lifting up our vision and seeing the structures to build and protect peace already in place, needing more public, political, and financial support to be fully effective. These structures stand on the base of the United Nations, created after World War II to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. 
The UN is the indispensable political body to build the conditions for peace. Yet today it is being swept aside in the crucible of war. Western countries particularly have been negligent of the very instrument chiefly founded by two Westerners, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. Starting in the 1980s, the West, led by the United States, has continually downgraded the UN as the principal instrument to preserve peace. It has assigned that role to NATO, a military alliance, which began its life in 1949 with 12 member nations and has now expanded to 31. The expansion brought in states that surround Russia, whose war-minded leader, Vladimir Putin, reacted by invading Ukraine. It's easy to condemn the Russian attack on Ukraine, as I do, but it is harder to face up to the factors that set the stage for the invasion. George Kennan, the famous US diplomat who first proposed the policy of containment of the Soviet Union, called NATO expansion, and I quote, the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era, unquote. Humiliated after the end of the Cold War, Russia increasingly felt vulnerable. That does not excuse Russia's attack on Ukraine, but it helps to explain the new environment it found itself in, especially when the U.S., openly sought dominance in the five spheres of air, land, sea, space, and cyber. The U.S. has planned $842 billion military budget for 2024 is greater than the next 10 greatest military spenders combined. The U.S. has military bases or presence in more than 70 countries. In the process of NATO expansion and the rise of the military industrial complex, driving arms spending and profits to ever new highs, the authority of the U.N. was weakened. In the first two decades of the 21st century, Western military dominance became the creed to counter the rise of authoritarians. International confrontation replaced cooperation. Belligerence became the dominant characteristic of the post-Cold War world. Military spending soared to new heights while the poorest of the world were abandoned. The wars in Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Ukraine all resulted from a clash of cultures, misreadings of history, and a steady erosion of the United Nations as the principal guardian of peace. The issue of peace in the world is far larger than the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Peace is a global issue. Thus, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is now preparing to publish a document called A New Agenda for Peace, which addresses a myriad of challenges the international community faces today. He will set out a comprehensive approach to prevention, linking peace, sustainable development, climate action, and food security. Guterres says that in order to protect and manage the global public good of peace, we need a peace continuum based on a better understanding of the underlying drivers of conflict. A renewed effort to agree on more effective collective security responses and a meaningful set of steps to manage emerging risks. This is a holistic approach to peace. The new agenda for peace is buttressed by a new effort made by nations to attend this coming September, 
the UN Summit on the Sustainable Development Goals. The 17 development goals have a 2030 target to eliminate the worst forms of poverty, but that target is now out of reach. Uh, a report pre being prepared to uh, for, for the uh, this forthcoming summit shows that only 12% of the targets of the, the sustainable development goals have actually been achieved at this point. The, the summit that's coming up is intended to be a rallying call for action to regain the lost ground on the SDGs from the twin blows of the pandemic and the Ukraine war. The summit was designed to reinvigorate the sense of hope, optimism, and enthusiasm that characterized the adoption of the SDGs in 2015. Now, the climate crisis of global warming is also a security issue because higher temperatures lead to famines and conflict over resources, tragedies in themselves, but which then lead to higher migrant and refugee rates. The 2023 final report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says it will take a quantum leap in global action to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. As world federalists, we must stand behind the United Nations as the indispensable instrument for peace and reject the odious and erroneous doctrine of NATO that more military spending will bring peace. Rather, we must urge our governments to concentrate on the new agenda for peace, the worrisome rate of progress toward the sustainable development goals, and the International Panel's stark warning on what must be done to stop the devastation of the planet. This multi-pronged effort to secure a just peace in political, social justice, and environmental terms is unprecedented. These three themes centering around global cooperation must be addressed to move forward in attaining what is every person's birthright, the human right to peace. Previous generations never considered peace as an actual right. It was seen in the instances when armies were not slaughtering one another as a sort of a blessing. Thinking changed when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948. Gradually, the frontiers of rights were expanded. And in 2016, the UN General Assembly adopted a document called the Declaration on the Right to Peace. The vote was 131 states in favor, 34 abstentions, and 19 opposed. Obviously, the world is split on the right to peace. But the very fact that this right is now on the global agenda marks the progress of humanity. Just as it was necessary to go beyond the charter in writing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the proponents of the right to peace assert it is now necessary to wrap the issues of peace and security, development and human rights into a single framework called the right to peace. Many states find this appealing because it reflects a holistic approach to peace. But several Western states vigorously reject this idea. In, uh, they hold that there is no legal basis for peace in international law and that it is impossible to find a common definition of peace grounded in human rights. So the drafters of the Declaration on the Right to Peace compromised and they wrote, and I quote, everyone has the right to enjoy peace such that all human rights are promoted and protected and development is fully realized, unquote. Well, that's not a perfect phrase, but it is a step forward. The Declaration on the Right to Peace lays the groundwork for a more secure world. Opponents doubtless fear that it will pave the way for a future comprehensive law against warfare, 
That, of course, is exactly what is intended. The development of public opinion to a higher level in opposing war is a necessary basis for a legal prohibition of war. Finally, the peace that I am talking about is not the peace of the idealist, expecting a utopia in this heavily burdened world. Rather, it is the peace of the realist, knowing that in the age of weapons of mass destruction and the globalization of life and death issues, such as climate change and pandemics, an acceptance of new rules for common security is essential. As United States President John F. Kennedy said in 1963, and I quote him, in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we're all mortal, unquote. Like Kennedy, I am talking about genuine peace the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living and the kind that enables peoples and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children, not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. Nonviolence is a guiding principle for a peaceful world. Nonviolence has more than a direct physical application. It applies to economic, and social relationships and the relationship of humanity as a whole to the planet. It is a new way of thinking and it needs to be espoused by political leaders, not just by academics or religious leaders. That is why security and economic and social development and climate change need to be examined in their interrelationship. That is what the Secretary General is trying to do. And we must urge our countries to back him strongly. Changing our attitude to reject militarism as such an important component of foreign policy, as Guterres has asked of all countries, would enable us to adopt a more holistic approach in pursuing a just peace. We may not yet have reached sufficient maturity of civilization to enforce the right to peace. Governments, at least some of them, powerful ones, are still too strong and are able to overcome the wishes of those who have turned against war. But this situation will not prevail forever. It will give way to those who demand the right to peace, just as the forces of slavery, colonialism, and apartheid gave way when the opposition became strong enough. That is why developing the elements of a culture of peace, such elements as education, sustainable development, respect for all human rights, equality between men and women, democratic participation, understanding and tolerance, free flow of information and human security for all. This list of components of a culture of peace is very important and it is hopeful. All this is the work of the World Federalists. Peace is a multi-dimensional subject. Those who came before us on this planet never faced the mix of dangers and opportunities that challenge the inhabitants of these first decades of the 21st century. Today, we have a vision of what is required to secure peaceful, coexistence on the planet. Our hope lies in implementing that vision. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, for that presentation. That was really wonderful and very concise. I'm just here today to introduce our moderator for the question and answer segment of this presentation, Thabo Qureshi, who is our policy youth fellow. One moment and I'll find her to pin. See, oh, there you are. 
Uh, yeah, thanks for introducing me, Erica. And thank you so much, Douglas, for your very insightful presentation. It was wonderful hearing from you, and we definitely appreciate you being here today. Um, just as a reminder before we get into the Q&A, for those wishing to ask um, a question, you can raise your hand using the raise hand feature and just make sure to keep your questions under a minute so we can keep things rolling. And you're also welcome to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, and I can kickstart with a question uh, if no one, okay, we have a hand raised. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself, Leon, and ask your question. Okay, hello, thank you for that presentation. Uh, uh, my question is, given the state that the world is in with uh, financial um, discrepancies and the uh, alliance between specific countries uh, such as uh, Russia, um, India, etc. I'd like to know what is your perspective on establishing peace from the uh, trade and global affairs perspective, given that there is going to be or there's they are posing a shift from the dominance of the United States dollar going forward. Well, thank you. Um, the reaction against the uh, super strength, you put it that way, of the US dollar is what caused the emergence of the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, China, India, and South Africa. And this consortium of uh, uh, powerful states, but not superpowers, uh, a new consortium uh, has come about over the past few years. It now represents about 40% of humanity. And uh, they are in the process of establishing a currency that will rival, if not overtake the, the uh, US dollar. That hasn't happened yet, but they're, they're continuing. Uh, and, and the Ukraine war has certainly been an interruption in this, as in so many other aspects of global life. But the emergence of, of the BRICS uh, uh, is a sign of a new kind of uh, multilateral uh, cooperation, uh, moving away from the bipolar world that we had we had a unipolar world after immediately after the, the uh, end of the cold war and then, then switched to a bipolar world and now there's this, uh, this great apprehension it's going to be uh, russia china and the united states as a as a three confrontational blocks that will that will impede uh, the cooperation that is needed like throughout the, the entire financial and trading systems uh, to benefit the most people on on the planet so the the uh, i would say the uh, the BRICS is a, is the forerunner of um, an international uh, trading system an international financial system that will rival the Bretton Woods uh, establishments set up after the end of uh, the Cold War when uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund came into existence as uh, principally Western um, Western powered uh, in in instruments that uh, acted uh, with uh, deleterious consequences for the states coming out of their colonial existence at, 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 at that at that time. In the 1970s, the, the states reacted against the Western-dominated economic system by forming the new international economic order, which unfortunately never became much more than a document itself. But the resistance to uh, Western-dominated international financial and trading systems has uh, now brought about a, a surge in a new kind of multilateralism, and, and the BRICS are at the forefront of that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have a hand raised from Alan. You can go ahead and ask your question. Doug, so good to see you again, and so wonderful to see that you're still inspirationally involved in these issues. Thank you so much for the presentation. Sorry, I missed a little bit of it, but I got a lot of it and it's wonderful there. Uh, the, the question I have, and, and I'm Alan Ware with uh, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, which uh, Doug uh, founded. He was the inaugural chair, and I'm also the program director for the World Federalist Movement. Uh, question I have is to do with 
the recent developments, I'd say, from uh, on threat of use of nuclear weapons in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, and the reaction of the G20 leaders in Bali, uh, and you know, Canada is one of the G20, where the leaders actually came out with a really surprising but very important uh, recognition that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. They agreed to that at the G20 summit in Bali. But then when they came to Hiroshima just a couple of weeks ago, they watered that whole thing down and said, well, it's only, you know, Russian threat of nuclear weapons, you know, that is inadmissible. How do you think we can keep G20 countries, you know, Canada and the others, to that wonderful statement that they gave in Indonesia, you know, that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible without caveat? Because uh, that is really important to take forward if we're going to encourage these countries that are relying on nuclear weapons that that is uh, an, uh, an illegitimate, a stupid path. It doesn't help with the security. Uh, we need to find, as you mentioned, common security approaches to dealing with these issues. But they seem to say one thing and then they backtrack. Do you think we can reinforce that statement from the G20 statement in Bali? Could we do it at the next G20 summit in India, for example, or take it to the UN General Assembly? And reinforce it. And what role can Canada play? In Canada is what is a key country. Well, two things, and then I'll come to Canada. The uh, certainly the uh, General Assembly is becoming stronger. I heard earlier today sort of a sort of a lament that the you, that the General Assembly doesn't have any strength, and uh, I, I I don't agree with that. I think it does have strength, and the, the Luxembourg uh, or, or exactly Luxembourg resolution calling for states to cast a veto to come and explain themselves before the general assembly now is one sign of the of the of the general assembly's uh, getting stronger well the inadmissible quote that you use alan is uh, is one sign of the difference between the g20 and the g7 uh, g, the g20 is a much broader base and one does look for india uh, now chairing and hosting the next g20 meeting to reinforce and elaborate on the statement that uh, the use of nuclear weapons is, is inadmissible. Obviously, the G7 wouldn't go along with that. And this is because they're still dominated by the NATO thinking that uh, nuclear weapons are the supreme guarantee of security. And that thinking uh, stops states, uh, certainly like Canada, uh, from uh, moving forward into, for example, uh, uh, recognition and, and uh, in joining the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So the the uh, nuclear weapons. I think I think we should we should all realize today that nuclear weapons are actually being used today. The threat of use in 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 Russia, in uh, by, the threat of use by Russia in in the Ukraine war, is itself a form of the use of nuclear weapons. So we have to recognize that. Um, uh, a, 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 a world moral, legal, public opinion push. I mean, in the combination of these tracts of, of, of action, it needs to be reinforced now, not waiting for the Ukraine war to, to get over. What I'm trying to say is that despite the continuation of the Ukraine war, we must reinforce efforts everywhere for nuclear disarmament, particularly calling on the United States and Russia to resume uh, talks on the uh, new start resumption of the new start treaty with a view to to uh, uh, making it a future to treaty after 2026 recognize that China will have to be part of, of those talks we have to push for nuclear disarmament measures now and not wait until there's a so-called better time when the Ukraine war will have ended in some way. So the statement that the G20 put out, uh, that the use of nuclear weapons is admissible, is, is a good start. It, it, it sort of, when one, one might say it bound the G20 together, I don't know how tightly it was bound, uh, but in any event, it it's there on the record and needs to be built on and, and elaborated. The, the next meeting of the non-proliferation treaty, the, the preliminary meetings of which are going to start uh, uh, shortly, 
um, will be doomed to repeated failure as long as the major states, uh, the United States, Russia, and, and, and China particularly, um, refuse to, to implement that basic step which is called for by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, namely to pursue comprehensive negotiations toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. And as long as they get away with ignoring that, uh, we will still continue this dilemma. And we're suffering through the use of nuclear weapons today through countenancing the very threat of the use of them. Great. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to read the next question from the chat. So what are the most critical steps that need to be taken to foster a culture of peace and nonviolence at both the national and international levels? Well, um, at the conclusion of uh, my, my remarks, um, I, I gave a list of uh, certain things uh, to concentrate on to elaborate and uh, foster uh, culture of uh, the culture of peace the um, the culture of peace came about in, in in a pretty good way in the late 1980s and then into the 1990s uh, when uh, an ambassador Chowdhury of Bangladesh led the way in getting a resolution adopted at the United Nations which set up a whole decade for a culture of peace, which was to have been the decade from 2001 to 2010. But the decade had hardly started when 9-11 terrorist attacks occurred, thereby by throwing everything at kilter and uh, brought back a resurgence of militarism. And people have forgotten how valuable the steps of a culture of peace would be in actually getting um, our, our society generally moving ahead to the recognition of, of the right to peace. And those steps in a culture of peace include education, education, uh, include pushing sustainable development, uh, respecting all human rights, equality between men and women, democratic participation, uh, more, more aspects of tolerance and understanding and a free flow of information and, uh, and an approach to common security. Those are actual areas of activity that need to be to be developed, pushed, advanced, worked on in order to establish a, a, a culture of peace to replace the, the culture of war. The culture of war dominated the last two centuries. And uh, we've had a history of, uh, you know, a succession of, of wars, which, uh, well, who knows how many people in total in war, I mean, two world wars with 100 million people killed and plus, plus the other wars. So moving from a culture of war that has dominated our thinking and our life and our systems to a culture of peace in which revolves around nonviolence as its, as its principal component um, is a long and lengthy journey. It cannot be accomplished overnight. It cannot like they switch you on a light bulb. But maybe the light bulb should be switched on in our heads to understand it, but, but moving our society is a long, long process. And those who engage or want to work in this need to have stamina, fortitude, and, uh, and uh, strength and courage to, to live through uh, the vicissitudes and the upsets and the valleys that we have to go through. And we're going through a very deep valley right now in the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war has brought back a resurgence of militarism and as I said in my remarks, led by NATO's insistence that everybody step up their military spending, and the military spending is the key to uh, to to ending to uh, ending war or, or finding peace. That 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 that's, that is uh, that 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 this two percent me metric that has been fo foisted on countries is a fraud. That that uh, we will all be. Uh, We'll all be, be 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 able to be, find security through spending two percent of our gross GDPs on uh, on NATO spending, on on arms spending through through the NATO process. And so we are being led astray, 
And in this process, as I tried to say in my remarks, the United Nations is being downvalued, downgraded, and pushed aside. Now, there could be a number of reasons for this, and, and uh, I, you know, I'm, but I, I, I stay with the charter and the institution of the <clears throat> of the UN, the framework we have, irrespective of personalities or or redundancies or weaknesses within the United Nations system itself. It's the only system we have, and we dare not lose it or see it trampled upon. And that is what is happening now. So um, I'm calling here for, especially people like like the, that are on this pro broadcast and uh, the people people like us, to stand up again and and push our own political systems the way that are open to us in our various contacts with, with our various political systems to enhance what the United Nations is doing and the principal way a principal source of activity in the United Nations is the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. These 17 goals embrace, uh, embrace everything, you know, virtually everything there is about human development to advance it as a means of security. And, and, we, and, and we must learn that, that, that security comes from the advancement of peoples rather than just building up military arsenals. And it's we, but we, we've been allowed ourselves to be bamboozled by the military-industrial complex, particularly those in 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 the Western case. I'm not saying that the other China and Russia have their own sets of establishments, but here in the West, the so-called leader of the of the world likes to think of itself as the leader of the world. Its policies are being are being formulated actually by the military-industrial complex. Those five major arms manufacturers they are colossal instruments in, in which they are so powerful that they fund the campaigns and, and, and uh, they, they, they literally choose who's going to uh, be, who's going to uh, win elections in, um, in members of the Armed Services Committee in both the House and the Senate and Republican or Democrat it doesn't make any difference. It's the people on those committees that continue to back uh, the, the, the spending. And if you if you if you notice, in, in the in the talks that have just concluded now with uh, President Biden signing the bill to extend the debt ceiling, um, the in in the negotiations that preceded the agreement in, that led to a vote, in those talks they they cut it into social spending, student loans, various things, but military spending no, mil it, cutting military spending already greater than the next ten countries, as I said was off the table so this is that's that's part of the culture of war so we, we got to use a, a diverse set of means that are open to us through education and development in human rights and, and, and different avenues to assert that we want the values of a culture of peace to overtake the values of a culture of war Thank you for that very thorough response. Um, we have another question in the chat from Blake. Um, Blake is asking, uh, Canada's, Ju Canada's Justin Trudeau and Minister Christy Freeland are vocal supporters of this expanding ideology. How do we uh, square our efforts in support of universal democratization with the Canadian government's position? Mm hmm well, Mr. Trudeau, um, I, I don't count myself as, as one of his chief fans, but Mr. Mr. Trudeau did say uh, in documents that uh, were then leaked or some, through some process that, that Canada would not reach 2% target. Our military spending is now $27 billion, and it would take another $20 billion to uh, to uh, uh, reach uh, the the two percent target. Now we're, we're, we're not going to do it because uh, that would cost us a lot in health and housing and various other social expenditures that are so much needed. And our country is now growing very quickly, uh, almost five hundred thousand immigrants per year uh, coming in. I'm all for that because I think that is demographically speaking, that's the only way. Uh, our country will, will will achieve some sort of reports. We're now close to 40 
40 million people, and uh, we need uh, we need uh, many millions more to find our rightful place in, in the world. So it's not going to be done through the birth rate. It's only going to be done through immigration. But as this happens, uh, the, uh, the pressure on our existing systems, housing, transportation, systems, and health systems particularly, uh, is 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 growing extremely tight, and 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 so is causing a lot of agitation inside country inside the country since these services are not being fully met. One of the reasons they're not being fully met is that there are more people demanding the services. So I want to repeat: I'm all for the entry of more people into Canada, but a result of that is it increases the pressure on the existing systems. And so, if you're going to have the military claiming they need more money for what? For what? They need more money for the so-called defense of Canada um, uh, at the expense of, uh, there's only so much money and there's only so much debt that they, that they can really get away with. Uh, it's it's going to cost, it's going to have re adverse repercussions on the economic and social system inside Canada to increase our military spending as has been demanded by the military industrial complex through the leaders of NATO. So. Mr. Trudeau and uh, Ms. Freeland uh, have uh, have their views. I, I I don't think they they see eye to eye on everything. I think that uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Freeland, the uh, deputy deputy prime minister, is is more uh, more aggressive, more militarily aggressive than than Trudeau is. So I, I do see divergencies in in the two of them. But uh, if one looks at uh, at the chief opposition. The Conservative Party in Canada, they, one uh, I think, would be rather delusional to think that uh, that they will, if they gained power in an election, that they would reduce all this military spending. I don't think I don't think that would happen. So it's it's um, a matter of of us asserting our values so that. Um, uh, military values do not drive foreign policy. Military values do not drive foreign policy. Um, there's a, a, a there's a great uh, I would call it a precedent or a, a great moment anyway in, in recent history to illustrate this, and that was when Gorbachev and the Soviet Union was going through its dissolution process and. But he came, Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev came to the, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, came to the United Nations, and I was there at the time, at the time in 1989, and he proclaimed a new foreign policy uh, that which the threat or the use of foreign, uh, the, the threat or use of military power would not be an instrument of foreign policy. Revolutionary. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Gorbachev did not last because of domestic problems inside, uh, inside uh, Russia which took him down, but he planted the idea. And it's an idea that we need to recover, particularly as world federalists, and drive that point home in every way we can, namely that foreign policy does not rest on military policy. Uh, thank you for that. Those were some great points. I'm gonna read a question from Alex in the chat. Um, Alex is asking, through your extensive experience as a parliamentarian and decades um, observing Canada's position on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, how would you rate our activity and voting record in relation to the average UN member state? How, is our, how has our involvement in these efforts improved or deteriorated over the years? Well, in, uh, that's a very good question. In 1983, uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, the father of the present Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau, as Prime Minister, went to the P5 capitals, um, urging uh, publicly and urging them to cease and desist the uh, nuclear arms race. And uh, he went very public on it. And that was an act of bold leadership. And um, in later years, um, when, when I was uh, chairing the Middle Powers Initiative with my friend Alan Ware, who spoke here a little bit earlier in this, a few moments ago, we went to various countries and so on. And But in any event, I, I met um, Mikhail Gorbachev, who told me 
that the result of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's actions in pressuring particularly Washington and Moscow to cease the nuclear arms race, uh, the result of that was the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which banned a whole class of nuclear weapons, intermediate, uh, intermediate nuclear weapons. And that, uh, well, you can't say that Trudeau got 100% of the credit goes to Trudeau. Trudeau was part of, was an important part of a process that took place that resulted in the United States and the Soviet, Soviet Union at the time entering into a uh, treaty to ban a class of nuclear weapons. So Canada's actions in earlier periods were... Uh, were stronger than than they now are. I have just published a, co a piece in the Hill Times last week, <clears throat> which I'm looking at to some of the background of what Alan was referring to earlier of the G20 and the G7, and which I said that Canadian policy is today ambiguous. Uh, here you have, on the one hand, <clears throat> the Canada's refusal to join the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or even to attend the meeting as an observer, we're putting some pressure on the government now to attend the second meeting of the state's parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which will be held in New York from November 7th to December the 1st, 2023. We're putting some pressure on Canada to attend. If they did not attend the first meeting, we said, well, that's the first meeting that was held of the state's parties. Uh, four uh, NATO countries did attend, Germany and the Netherlands, um, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, and uh, Finland uh, did attend, and uh, the roof didn't fall in. So why can't you go? And they said, "Yeah, but the, you know, they, those countries got a lot of blowback from NATO headquarters for doing that." I said, "Well, you know, are you afraid of blowback from from um, from uh, from NATO headquarters?" And well, apparently they are. So uh, here is we are now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it, it, it's it's a sad irony that here in Canada we're using up our our political capital, our access to the to the ministries. I mean, in our our ability to influence the system, we're using that up to to please to kind of just to attend as an observer a meeting, let alone drive a process that will produce actual negotiations to eliminate nuclear weapons under the under the precepts of the NPT. So we're using up our, our energy on that. That all that being said, on the other hand, Canada has been leading the way through a process to get a fissile material cutoff treaty. It was a treaty that would stop the processes of producing fissile material. This has been going on for years and years. And it would take a, another, another blank of this whole program just to go through all that background. But they have insisted uh, hitherto that the negotiations for an FMCT, as it's called, Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, uh, take place in the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. And everybody who follows that knows that the, uh, that the Conference on Disarmament is in Geneva is a moribund instrument. It's got 61 countries in it. And it, because it operates on a consensus rule, virtually every country has a veto. I mean, if you don't get 100% agreement, then the thing can't go through. And Pakistan, is, among others, have been blocking Canada's uh, effort to get negotiations started. So now, as a result of our pressure, we have uh, we have we just learned that that uh, uh, Canada is going to sponsor, or is it's Canada is preparing the way to sponsor a resolution in the first committee uh, this fall uh, that will call for negotiations for an FMCT to take place in the General Assembly where it's by voting. And of course, it was through the General Assembly action, we got the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So uh, that's why I, I return just for a second to that statement about the United Nations uh, you know, weakened and the General Assembly. The General Assembly has more strength than is generally credited with, uh, credited with and uh, it, uh, it, has, um, the, it has the potential for, for exercising more strength through the United for Peace resolutions and, and all, all the things that go with that, if the nations would push for it. So finally, on Canada, um, I mean, Canada, look at, Canada was the first country in the world. It was part of the Manhattan Project. Canada, uh, with Britain and, uh, and the United States, to produce the darn things in the first place. So Canada was the first country in the world to have had the ability to produce nuclear weapons and to renounce that ability. No. So Canada does not have nuclear weapons. 
and which is a pretty good thing. Um, and we have we have standing, we have an ability uh, to exercise as as Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau demonstrated in, in going around the world in 1983 at a time of very heightened tensions. Um, we have the ability and we're not using it because uh, there's a lapse in, uh, in the bureaucracy. There's certainly a lapse in the political, um, the parliamentarians. Uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, it, I'm sorry to say this, but you know, because I was a parliamentarian myself in in, uh, in in Ottawa for a lot of years, the parliamentarians have lost their zip, they've lost their steam, they've lost their way uh, in respect of uh, working on common security problems, uh, with nuclear disarmament being a, a forerunner to reaching common security. They've lost their way, and they're into 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 the they're they're into the peanuts section of politics in, in my view now and i don't know exactly what to do about it but uh, the answer to your question is that canada is uh, is ambiguous the canada doesn't want nuclear weapons it would like to participate in in uh, in um uh, in a um uh, in a in, in in the process of getting to a nuclear weapons free world but it is stymied it is intimidated it is a uh, it is held back it is held um, i would say it's, it's even held hostage by its membership in nato Great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have four minutes remaining for this session, so this will be the last question if, if anyone has um, another question. If not, then I can pass it over to Alex for the closing remarks. I don't think I see any. Uh, yeah, I don't see any either. So uh, yeah, you can go great. ahead. Thanks so much, Saba. That was great. And thank you so much, um, Douglas, uh, for that wonderful um, presentation and uh, great answers to those questions. Uh, so if there are no more questions, I will then um, give us an eight minute break or seven minute break now until we go to uh, the second committee session. So um, uh, if you want to stay along uh, and see uh, how we're doing with our own attempts at achieving nuclear disarmament non-proliferation, um, feel free to stick with us. But thank you so much for joining and uh, giving all that information. <laughs>